I mean, this two-day session was about crypto economics. We've heard a lot of really cool talks. Uh, one thing I feel like we haven't heard much, and it's kind of one of the central things about economics or what people like about economics, is saving money. So that's what I'll be talking about uh, today. And this is some joint work with um, collaborators at Cornell. So imagine that maybe some of you this morning went and grabbed a coffee somewhere in SF, so these prices won't even be too extravagant, especially if it was here at the Hilton. Um, so suppose that maybe at the beginning of the week you went to a coffee shop, they told you it's $4 for your coffee, and your credit card makes you pay a 10 cent fee. And then a little later in the week you go back and the coffee still costs $4, but now all of a sudden they make you pay six dollars and more in transaction fees. Uh, you probably wouldn't be very happy with this. Um, it turns out that in Ethereum, uh, things do tend to look a little bit like this. So if you sort of plot the, this isn't quite the transaction fee, it's actually the daily uh, mining fee reward, but those are somewhat correlated. If you plot this over a period of somewhat more than a year, you'll see that there's like huge spikes in, um, the amount of money you have to spend on transaction fees. And some of these more drastic events are actually well known to probably a few of you. Uh, this first one here was when CryptoKitties started and all of a sudden the network went completely crazy. People had to pay enormous amounts of fees to still get their transaction through. Um, more recently, this even bigger spike here was um, this exchange called Fcoin that had people sort of do some kind of on-chain voting by sending transactions, and this also completely blocked the network for a little while. Um, and this isn't unique to Ethereum, so you could look at even Bitcoin that doesn't have the same fancy smart contracts, and you'll see similar spikes in transaction fees. Um, interestingly, these spikes are actually somewhat correlated between currencies, so you can see that there's the same spike in January when CryptoKitties came out, another spike in July with um, Fcoin. Not sure exactly where this correlation comes from, but it's somewhat interesting to observe. So this kind of volatility in transaction fees isn't very good. It means you cannot really plan ahead. You don't really know how much your transactions are going to cost tomorrow. Maybe it's going to be 10 times as much as today. Um, and I mean, ordinary businesses will face this problem as well. And they obviously don't want this for sort of prices to vary as much. So how do they usually deal with this? Well, one way is if you have, say, a physical resource, you're just going to try and stockpile it when prices are low. And for other types of resources, you might try to just buy some kind of financial instrument, like a, a futures contract or an option that sort of lets you some kind, say, speculate over differences in prices over time and try to sort of guard against these huge spikes in volatility. Um, the problem is it's, it's not very clear how you would do something like this with transaction fees. Of course, you could, we could set up just a, a futures contract where, say, we um, gamble on what the transaction fees will be in Ethereum in a, in a few months from now. But there isn't really a straightforward way that you can do this on-chain, sort of directly in the system um, today. And this is where gas token comes in. So this is actually a mechanism, uh, I must say, full disclosure, a fairly inefficient mechanism, uh, as we'll see. But it actually lets you do something like this. So it lets you stockpile and trade Ethereum gas. Um, and it's usable directly now in the network. Or, uh, we actually created a token out of this that is live uh, that I'll talk about in more detail um, in the rest of this talk. So first of all, let me give uh, an overview of how gas actually works in Ethereum. So if you have a, a smart contract, like the simple contract here that does some arithmetic, some hashing, maybe stores some values in um, global storage, the Ethereum virtual machine sort of specifies that each of these instructions has a specific cost, which is expressed in a sort of internal currency um, called gas. And some operations are more expensive than others, especially you can see that sort of writing to storage is a very, very expensive operation um, because this is sort of altering the global state of Ethereum that um, people then have to store over time. And so when a user wants to run um, a function in this contract, he'll create a transaction for this and then just um, 
specify to the miner sort of what kind of price he's willing to pay for this transaction. And this is where um, a sort of implicit conversion between this internal gas currency and the real Ethereum currency, Ether, takes place. So usually you specify the gas price um, in GigaWay, where Way is the smallest uh, de denomination of Ether. Um, and so depending on how much you're willing to pay for these units of gas, this will determine how expensive your transaction is in Ether. And then miners, well, they can decide whether they want to include this transaction or not. Maybe there's other people who are willing to pay more um, Ethereum per unit of gas, and so they maybe just refuse your transaction. So then maybe you might have to sort of give more transaction fees to get your transaction through, at which point the miners might finally accept it. Okay, so how do we get from here to gas tokens? So again, here the problem is that this gas um, currency is sort of, it's internal to the system. You can't really hold any of it. You can't have an account that has gas. It can have ether. But the conversion rate between gas and ether changes over time. That's exactly why you have these huge spikes in transaction fees. And so you can't really stockpile gas. Um, it turns out actually you can. Uh, not in a very efficient way. And that's what I'll get to right now. So as I said before, there are certain things in Ethereum that are very expensive. And these are uh, operations that change the global state. So the two main examples of this are writing to a contract storage or creating a new contract. This means that now all of a sudden there's some new information that um, everyone who holds a copy of the Ethereum blockchain has to store. So these operations are expensive to sort of avoid flooding the network or uh, preventing DOS attacks. At the same time, um, Ethereum wants to incentivize users to clean up after themselves so that if your contract isn't in use anymore, say, you'd want some incentive for people to delete their contract so that they don't just clog the network forever. And so what Ethereum does is that once you delete some storage that you no longer need, um, you actually get some refund, um, which can be used for the current transaction that you're, uh, that you're sending to the network. And so this is exactly what we do with gas token. At some point in time, when gas prices are relatively low because the network is maybe underutilized, we'll have a contract that you can tell to write a whole bunch of basically garbage uh, into storage. And this won't be very expensive because gas prices are low. Um, at a future point in time, well, all of a sudden transaction fees go through the roof, but you still want to do some, uh, some work on Ethereum, you can now call this contract and tell it to release this storage that it accumulated over time. And you can use all these gas refunds that are now actually worth way more money because the gas price went up. Um, and this can actually refund up to half of the cost of the transaction that you're currently operating. It's not quite 50%, we'll get to that, but you can get pretty close. Um, this, this main idea of sort of stockpiling gas as storage is actually something that had been around for a while. The earliest reference I know of this is uh, um, attributed to um, uh, Vitalik uh, a while ago, a few years ago in uh, some GitHub issue. Um, what we did that um, wasn't really, uh, no one had really thought of doing before is to sort of take this idea and make a token out of it. And the nice thing with this is that now you don't really have to do this uh, whole gambling process necessarily individually. So anyone who thinks that the gas prices will rise in the future could start writing um, into the storage of our gas token contract. And then you can start trading these slots the same way you trade any other ERC-20 token. And so someone who suddenly knows that they're gonna have a very expensive um, or a very heavy computation to do, and they know that the gas prices are gonna be high, they could buy these gas tokens from other people who were sort of planning ahead um, and get, use these to get refunds on their expensive transactions. So that's how you'd end up basically saving money, and at the same time, maybe the, the hope also would be that if a lot of people start using these kind of mechanisms the same way as uh, futures are used in, in real life for these purposes, that 
you could somehow try to balance, sorry, or get rid of some of these excess volatility in these transaction fees over time. So as, a, as an example to maybe illustrate a bit how this happens, so suppose, well, you want to breed some crypto kitties. The gas prices are relatively high at around 40 gigawatts. Um, gigaway, sorry, this isn't actually that high anymore. Um, in at least when when the price went really through the roof, it went I think up to 100 or even more gigaway at times. Um, but anyway, suppose now this transaction costs maybe about 250,000 gas, which I think is approximately what breeding a, a crypto kitty actually costs. So this would cost about, I mean, at the time that I made these slides, I don't remember what the price of Ethereum was back then, uh, but this would have cost about $9. So now we're going to go back in time to a time when gas prices were a little bit more comfortable, where for one gig away you could actually get your transactions accepted by the network. What we're going to do is we're going to call this gas token contract and just tell it to sort of store a bunch of words into memory. This is also going to cost a lot of gas because we're altering storage, uh, but the gas price is so low that this is really just going to cost us a few cents. And this is sort of assuming that the price of Ethereum doesn't change. Now we're going back to our future contract where we're trying to breed crypto kitties, uh, but instead of just breeding crypto kitties in this one transaction, we're going to also, in the same transaction, tell this gas token contract to just release all of this storage. And this will actually give us a really big gas refund. And now all of a sudden, this heavy transaction, after you take the refund into account, will cost you around $5 rather than 9 So even if you take the whole system into account, you've basically spent about $5.2 instead of nine. And these are the kind of savings that you could expect to achieve with um, gas token if you gamble correctly on the differences in prices of, uh, of gas. So some details, you'll find more of these on the website we've dedicated to this token. We actually have two variants of gas token. One that uses storage. This one is sort of very in, uh, simple to understand. It basically just writes ones into storage and then replaces them by zero to get refunds. Um, we actually have a more efficient variant that's a bit more complicated because it makes use of um, contract creation. So you have one gas token contract that every time you want a new token, it basically creates a new child contract. Um, and it turns out that the refund when you destroy contracts is slightly better than what you get for creating or sort of writing to global storage and erasing from global storage. Um, so this contract is a little bit more efficient um, and in general you can always get some kind of savings at least in theory when the gas volatility sort of ah, there we go when the so when the differences in gas prices over time between the time that you store things in this uh, contract and the time that you erase them if the difference in gas prices exceeds 2x um, you, you'll be in the clear, basically. Um, yeah, we have some plots that I won't go into too much detail. Basically, they show that these two variants of the contract, um, there's a small regime where this difference in gas prices is between roughly 2 and 3.7, where this first simpler version is slightly better, but then for anything bigger than that, so especially if you look at some of these prior spikes that were maybe a 100x um, difference in gas prices, there our second version is much, much more efficient and that's the one that, uh, yeah, we'd, uh, we'd expect people to, to try and use. So this is the website we've dedicated to this token. As you can see, we have two of these tokens registered. Um, you'll notice maybe there's something kind of funny and technical about this second contract, the one that uses, that creates subcontracts, it has a very special address that starts with a lot of zeros. Uh, it turns out that among all the contracts that are not hard coded in Ethereum, at least at the time that we created this, this was the contract that had the largest string of sort of trailing zeros. Um, it's sort of in some sense the most expensive contract to create on the network. Um, 
the way we did this is just offline by going through about two to the 14 nonces until we found one that gave us the right contract address. Um, and it turns out that this is useful because every time we create subcontracts, we have to embed the address of the gas token contract into that subcontract so that it sort of knows what its parent is. And sort of the shorter this address is um, in hexadecimal, the less gas you end up paying, so the contract ends up more efficient. If you actually could get an address with even more zeros, which ends up being a little bit tricky in terms of computation, uh, you could get an even more efficient variant of, of this scheme. So I've promised all of this that people could maybe try and save money if they do things correctly. Um, we're fairly confident that the contract works. We've tested it, but I mean, there could be bugs, so don't trust me on it either. I've written a fair amount of bugs in Ethereum to not trust my own code anymore. Um, but it actually turns out that so far, not that many people uh, have started using this contract. Uh, there's a lot of gas token, there's like 7,000 something that have been mined so far. Uh, like 90% of them actually belong to us. Um, and to be honest, we're not entirely sure why that is. It seems it's sort of some kind of game theoretic analysis here would say that if users of the system were somewhat rational, um, this in a lot of situations, this would seem like a, a sort of simple and um, yeah, normal thing to do. And there's been even some nice follow-up work on this. There was a, a nice blog post by um, uh, sort of showing how to turn smart contracts into so-called gas token factories. So this is essentially if you're trying to do an ICO, how you could directly embed the ideas from our gas token contract into, into your ICO contract. And there's a lot of other contracts out there maybe the, that could benefit from this. The, the best example maybe would be airdrops. So these are um, sort of token creators that just decide to send tokens to a whole bunch of people on the network. And here, if you know, for instance, that you're gonna do an airdrop sometime in the future, well, you know that you're gonna be um, spending a lot of money on transaction fees because you're gonna be doing a lot of transactions. Um, and if it's going to be a very big airdrop, you can probably also, um, you might know that the, the gas price will just go up just because you're really overutilizing the network. So if you sort of know that you're going to be doing something very, very heavy like this in the, uh, at some point in the future, well, there's really a, an incentive there to just start stockpiling um, some storage ahead of time to get this nice gas refund. And you don't even have to use gas token, I mean, our contract to do this. You can just do this by yourself as well. Uh, as I said before, the only thing that gas token really adds to this is this nice ERC-20 mechanism on top of it where people can just sort of exchange these storage slots um, or sort of trade them with each other. Uh, interestingly, we actually got some sort of backhand evidence that there are arbitrage bots out there that are using sort of similar techniques to gas token. They're not using our contract itself, I think just because they want this to remain somewhat stealthy. But this is also a, actually an example where it makes a lot of sense that they're doing this because arbitrage bots are essentially trying to run transactions all the time as soon as they see an opportunity to sort of front run some exchange transaction maybe and make some money. And so if they can lower their transaction fees even by a little bit. It just sort of extends the margins they can make or sort of which transactions are beneficial for them to front run. So sort of taking a step back, why, why is this even possible? Sort of why, why do we even have this kind of weird mechanism in Ethereum? Um, in some sense, it seems like it can be gamed with this um, sort of weird and inefficient contract that in the end, I mean, actually, if a lot of people started using gas token, um, well, there would just be more cluttered state uh, in Ethereum, which is not necessarily something that's beneficial for the network. So in some sense, it would be much better if there was a more efficient way of doing the same kind of speculation on transaction fees, or if this kind of gas refund mechanism just didn't exist in the first place. Um, but yet, this, this sort of leads to a problem because 
As I said earlier, while well, blockchain state, um, sort of writing to it has to be some kind of, it has to be expensive because it is permanent. Like if you write to storage or say in Bitcoin, if you have something that ends up in the UTXO set, well, people will just have to store this forever. And uh, there's also where a lie sort of, that's the, the fundamental part of the problem is that you're actually paying a sort of one-time fee um, and possibly you're giving recurring and sort of indefinite costs to the network by doing this. So you pay some amount of money at some point in time, but maybe this contract you've created will just remain in the blockchain for the next hundred years um, without you having to, to pay for it to stay there. Um, and even the sort of the way that these things are priced are a tiny bit arbitrary. So in Ethereum, for instance, the fact that writing to storage costs 20,000 gas and not 15,000 or 23,000 or 110,000. I mean, these things have been set at some point. They've been changed in the past, but there's not really some clear cut ideas or, or sort of guidelines on how these values should really be set. And in the end, you still want some incentive somehow for users to clean up after themselves. Um, and this can actually be problematic. So in, in Bitcoin, for instance, and I've, I've recently heard this about, uh, this is a bit of a weird issue in Litecoin as well, that they have UTXO sets where there's actually quite a large number of transactions um, that have absolutely no positive incentive to be spent in that the sort of the transaction fee that you would have to pay to remove this, um, to sort of clear this out of the UTXO set is higher than the amount of money that's even in there. So there's really no positive incentive to do anything with these and you would just leave them there forever. And that's kind of bad. Um, so one alternative that's been proposed um, in Ethereum for dealing with, with storage is this concept of rent. And so here the idea would be that instead of just paying once a sort of one-time transaction fee for writing to the contract something that's going to stay there for all eternity, the idea would be that you have to pay rent for storage and for contracts or sort of anything that lies on the blockchain. And if the rent is unpaid, the storage would just be erased after a certain amount of time. And by doing this, well, you could just get rid of this refund scheme entirely. Because now the, the incentives are sort of different in that you sort of force people to continuously pay over time if they want things to remain on the blockchain. Um, of course, this is really tricky to, to implement correctly because already now as a developer of a smart contract, there's a lot of things you have to think about to sort of make sure that in any possible situation your smart contract executes correctly. Um, now all of a sudden you're going to add on top of this that maybe some of your storage might get deleted over time because you didn't pay rent for it or maybe some contracts that you depend upon might get deleted um, because their rent wasn't paid and so this could lead to a whole other set of sort of security issues and this could become a, a big mess if not implemented correctly. And also for certain things like the UTXO set in, uh, in Bitcoin for instance, it's, it's not really clear whether this concept of rent um, even makes sense. So the sort of bigger picture here um, is something that with my collaborators at Cornell we're calling Project Chicago and this is essentially, um, we're trying to initiate the study of what we call um, crypto commodities and these are these sort of raw resources or commodities that blockchains depend on and that people haven't really given a lot of thought until now on how to price these um, in the right way. Sort of since in the past year, people have sort of started thinking about these a little more. Um, so memory, as we've seen, that's maybe the one that people have thought about quite a bit, but still that doesn't, um, so far, that you, we still have problems like things like gas token that can sort of exploit quirks in the way that memory um, or block space is being priced um, and computation as well. 
and the network uh, resources. There's other things that are sort of priced in a very ad hoc way right now in these blockchains. And uh, there hasn't really been a, a sort of in-depth analysis of what the right way of dealing with these is. And sort of also how, how to actually trade these commodities. So here we've taken one example, gas or sort of transaction fees, where there isn't really a nice in protocol or sort of in system way of trading um, these commodities with other users of the system. So some of the things we've been thinking about uh, for the future, um, so of course the sort of most obvious thing that we'd like is to be able to do something similar to gas tokens, so letting people sort of um, bet on transaction fees or provide futures on transaction fees, but in a much, much more efficient way by not having to abuse this sort of refund mechanism of Ethereum. Um, and one way you could do this, and uh, my collaborators at, at Cornell have actually started working on this, is by essentially you'd, you'd have to use some kind of date, on-chain data oracle. And the way this could work is you could have a contract where you'd have one party I mean, two parties here, Alice and Bob, that sort of entered this futures contract where Bob says, well, on some date in the future, say April 1st, um, he'll pay for Alice's transaction. And I mean, he doesn't know at that point how much that's going to cost him, but that's the point of this futures contract. And then when April 1st comes along, well, Alice has a transaction to run. Um, and at this point, the contract sort of has to know what the actual gas price is so that it can charge Bob the right amount. And this is where you'd need maybe some kind of data oracle that can sort of tell you what the actual gas price um, is in Ethereum at that time. And from there on, the contract could just sort of give the right amount of money um, from Bob to Alice. So this would be a sort of a simple futures contract where you don't have any of this inefficiency of requiring storage or refunds or this sort of limit of 50% that comes with gas token, um, but it requires this extra trust assumption on an on-chain oracle. As I mentioned before, there's other crypto commodities that might be interesting to analyze, things like network uh, costs or other costs uh, associated with computation or storage. And um, another thing we've been quite interested in thinking about is how you could even sort of get futures um, resolved at a sort of consensus level where you would essentially enter a, a future with, with someone and then if, if at a certain point in the, in the future you're running a, a transaction that isn't backed by this kind of contract, maybe the, the miners would just reject it. Um, but this would of course require um, a lot more work. This would require in protocol changes and these are also sort of these kind of mechanisms really haven't been analyzed yet to figure out what the right approach would be. So if you want to learn more about this, we have a website dedicated to gas token where you can read more about how it actually works um, and how efficient it is. And we have a website dedicated to this uh, ongoing research project on Project Chicago. And yeah, if you have any ideas or things you've thought about in this realm of sort of crypto commodities and the uh, pricing of resources in blockchains, um, happy to hear about them or to answer any questions. Thanks a lot your attention. Cool. Well, thanks a lot for attending the event and, uh, well, I don't know if there's anything planned right now, but enjoy.